So hey everybody, my name is uh, Tyler Dirksen. I'm a cloud solution developer here at uh, Imagine It in Winnipeg. Um, and I'm just gonna be talking to you today about uh, cloudservices.net and you. Um, and so that's me and I want to quickly get into this because we have a fair bit to cover um, because cloud services are, are kind of a complex thing. So let's, uh, let's get going. So this is essentially the Azure ecosystem. Um, you have three options when you're actually talking about Windows Azure and, and Windows uh, Azure ecosystem for compute. You have a lot, a lot of different options for storage and other services, but there's three main things for, for computing power and actually executing things on Windows Azure. There's websites, cloud services, and virtual machines. So websites, um, and they're kind of very different from each other and, and they vary in the levels of control and, and flexibility. Um, so starting with control websites, it's basically like IIS hosting. You have the, a fairly minimal amount of control um, and you host uh, web, web applications and Node.js or ASP.NET or PHP, a variety of different frameworks, but you don't have a whole lot of control over those frameworks and you don't have a lot of control, if anything at all, on the actual underlying machine. Cloud services provides you a little bit more control um, where you actually can set up a VM uh, and uh, make changes to that VM and different things like that. Um, and then virtual machines give you the full control of actually setting up a, a, a virtual machine um, and making persistent changes to that virtual machine uh, that will uh, be long running. And then the same kind of trend for flexibility where you actually have more capabilities for cloud services than with websites, but you have the most flexibility with virtual machines. But you also have this red line, which is, um, you know, there's very little to no management complex, uh, complexity on websites. And uh, there are some management complexity of cloud services, but virtual, machine is by, virtual machines are by far the most complex. And in that you actually need to upgrade them um, and uh, upgrade the uh, operating system versions yourself, which is a fairly, fairly large set of complexity. Um, so the main thing is that, you know, as you think about what you're actually running on the cloud, you kind of have to think about how much control do you actually want? Are you doing something quite um, complex uh, or something that is kind of legacy where you would actually need to very specifically set up a virtual machine? So you're kind of on the virtual machine side, or are you doing something fairly basic um, and uh, common like running a PHP site or, or ASP.NET site and uh, you don't really require things to change. If you're somewhere in the middle, which most people are, um, then you'd be kind of in the cloud services realm and that's what I'm gonna be talking about today is, uh, is the cloud services piece. So to kind of go on along with this, what kind of, uh, what kind of things can you actually put onto the Azure ecosystem um, in a, all of these different kind of levels? So there's a variety of different gallery images um, and galleries for websites and virtual machines. And uh, there's some, some out of the box solutions you can do with cloud services as well. Um, but you know, with websites, you can do WordPress sites. With virtual machines, you can do uh, you know, Windows machines or Linux machines with Ubuntu and different things like that. So what does that actually give you the ability to do? You can do get sharing sites, social sites, um, you know, provide a lot of uh, capabilities to your websites and as well as provide the ability to build uh, complex end tier, multi-tier applications that include some level of uh, web uh, tier and uh, API, web API and, and web page and different things like that. And you can also get into the kind of line of business thing. Um, the cloud is not only for you know public stuff, uh, you can have internal applications running in the cloud and different things like that. And plus with virtual machines and, and uh, virtual networks and connections and things, um, you can create hybrid solutions, specialized solutions, uh, migrate legacy solutions a lot easier, as well as uh, coordinate with on-prem um, kind of solutions with the, the rest of the Microsoft stack. So how are you actually going to accomplish all this stuff? There's a variety of different services that are you know, consider Windows Azure that I'm not really going to go into today. And uh, I might touch on a couple of them, um, but know that they're kind of out there. There's there's a variety of uh, extra services on top of the compute services that I just discussed um, that you can actually uh, uh, use in, in Windows Azure. And so essentially all of this put together gives you a very nice, rich global presence 
um, for your applications or your projects in uh, in the cloud. And that's essentially what the cloud is for. So you can essentially say, um, you know, it's easy to put stuff out there um, on the internet and on it, globally accessible um, data centers. So, like I said, I'm actually going to be digging into kind of the cloud services piece um, for this particular talk. So this is just going to be a quick overview on uh, what is essentially a cloud service. Um, a cloud, why would you actually want to go with a cloud service versus a virtual machine or a website? Lots of people when they're thinking about clouds, they tend towards the virtual machine side and especially if you're kind of in the IT industry, you're used to hosted VMs, um, grid hosting and, and virtual machine hosting has actually been around for, for quite a while. But why would you kind of go one level below um, on that chart and, uh, and go towards a cloud service or go a little bit above a website? Cloud service allows you to build very, very highly scalable applications, which you can scale up and down with basically the click of a button or the change of a number. Um, and, uh, and we'll see how kind of that works in a couple of the demos. Um, as well, cloud services, a little bit better than websites, will allow for rich multi-tier architectures where you could have, you know, front um, listening, uh, uh, like HTTP traffic listening services, um, like websites, ASP.NET, PHP, whatever, and you can also have other uh, pieces of, of your application sitting in the back listening on, you know, data changes, uh, doing nightly processes or, or, you know, timed processes and different things like that. Um, you, you can provide a rich, rich uh, multi-tier architecture very, very easily. And as well, you know, why would you pick a cloud service? Because it's platform as a service, you get this very, very rich automated application management and packaging system, um, which I'm going to go into, and which is a huge, huge benefit when you are, uh, you know, thinking about your application and think about your deployments. If you can actually say and package everything up really nice and neat with a nice little bow and say, this is actually my application, um, which is very easy to do with the cloud service. So what is a cloud service? A cloud service uh, is a essentially a collection of roles. So what are roles? There's two different types of roles. Uh, well, well, I'll first explain exactly what a role is. It's basically a configured virtual machine, a pre-configured virtual machine that, that uh, kind of serves a, a kind of a single purpose. So in our situation here, we have web roles and we have worker roles. There's um, there could be any a couple of different other kinds, like a cache role or or a VM role, which is a little bit different than a pers persistent virtual machine. Um, but I'll kind of focus on the web role and worker role right now. Um, so, essentially, what can you put on these web and worker roles? It sounds kind of constrained, but really it's not. Um, so, essentially, the web and worker roles are defined um, uh, kind of templates that will go onto. A, window, a Windows virtual machine or Windows server machine. So as a general rule, um, if it runs on Windows, it can run in a cloud service because that's exactly what you are doing. Um, because it can run in, win uh, because you have that capability, you have a very, very wide variety of choices of language and framework uh, frameworks that you can actually use on a cloud service. So just because you, it looks like you have this fairly strict um, kind of constrained structure or platform as a service kind of structure. Um, don't think that that means you have to use .NET or you have to use Microsoft languages or anything like that. There's actually a very, very wide variety and, ex and expanding every day um, set of languages and frameworks that will actually run or have uh, kind of pieces that are, or are pre-configured uh, to run on, on cloud services on Windows Azure. So. Um, so platform as a service doesn't necessarily mean you're buying into a certain, a very, very strict set of technologies and pl uh, platforms and languages and things like that. Um, you can use any variety of, uh, of languages, even a combination of a bunch of them. So what is this, these roles that I was, that I was kind of talking about? What is a web role? A web role is essentially um, an endpoint, a public endpoint capable uh, uh, Windows virtual machine. And uh, so essentially, it's a virtual machine that is running IIS, um, starting out with, you know, ASP.NET, but you can host a variety of other things with fast CGI, uh, like PHP and Node.js and whatever. Um, and uh, so, but essentially, it is your web endpoint. 
um, it and you can do uh, HTTP, HTTPS, TCP uh, connections to this web role, um, persistent connections using Signal R, variety, very very wide variety of different things that you can do with uh, with a web role. Um, but it's basically the, at the heart of the web role. Um, managing the lifecycle of whatever's running on this web role is, is IIS. So essentially, if you're running something that sits on top of IIS or is managed by IIS, um, it, Internet Information Services, the, the web server for Microsoft, then uh, uh, you're, you're essentially using a web role. Now, that being said, there is a variety of other scenarios, especially in multi-tier applications, that are not running on IIS, and you actually manage the application lifecycle yourself. <clears throat> this would be uh, similar to a Windows service and, uh, and some background processing. Um, so if you are you know, thinking about the architecture of your applications, and you think, oh, well, this portion of the application runs on a persistent Windows service, then you're actually thinking about a worker role. Um, so there's a couple of different you know, ways uh, to, uh, to implement a worker role or reasons that you'd implement a worker role. Outlined on the slide here, there's a queue polling worker. So you actually you know, uh, have a continuous while true loop and, uh, and you are actually just processing messages off of a queue. Um, you can also use a listening worker role. So you can actually start a WCF service host um, we can, which you can do without using IIS um, and run it off of, you know, system.web or the .NET framework. Um, so you can, you know, run an, at, at .NET SMTP server or WCF service or, you know, and even, um, you know, ex execute any other types of, uh, of web listeners or, or basically anything you want. Like you, you basically just have a set of code or a virtual machine and it will run. And uh, whatever you want to actually do with that virtual machine, you can open up web endpoints. You don't have to think that you actually have to use a web role or go through a web role to actually get to your service. You can open web um, port endpoints through to a worker role as well. Um, you can even open ports between two roles internally and, and a variety of different things. Um, so we'll, we'll see the code when I actually get into a demo. I believe that's uh, going to be right away. But... Uh, uh, you actually have just a set of code that runs and that you have to manage your own lifecycle with a worker role. So we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so what, uh, now what do these roles actually, you know, do um, or, or how do they actually perform? So essentially I want to get into the role lifecycle um, because you are essentially building on top of a platform. And so just like you're building a Windows phone app or some sort of other application, you kind of have to understand how, you know, what the life cycle is going to be like or what happens or what what is called when your application or your virtual machine is being set up or being torn down or it stops unexpectedly and different things like that. Um, so the, the actual uh, system that controls your virtual machine and your application is called the app fabric. Um, so this is essentially what the app fabric calls. It calls methods in your assemblies called, uh, you know, that are labeled on start um, and overrides that are that are doing the on start uh, method. So you actually have the ability to run code whenever your virtual machine starts up. Um, and then if you are actually looking at this machine from the outside, it will actually, if you run a status check, it will show status busy. Now, when you're running a worker role or a web role, well, the web, web role will actually run IAS during the run portion. And then you will actually see that the, the uh, role is ready. Um, and But if anything uh, uh, happens to it, then it will go into a stop state, which I'll go into in a second. And only when the actual... Um, status check returns as ready or you've entered the actual run method, um, will you receive requests from the load balancer? Uh, so that's a kind of a very important distinction because if you are balancing the application and it's being transferred from one machine to the other, it has to be shut down and moved. Um, you want to make sure that this particular machine is not receiving traffic while it's actually still executing the on start um, uh, method. And then if you uh, if the fabric wants to stop this uh, server for any reason because it has to balance it out or something has happened uh, that it needs to stop the server, um, it will you know show a status check of busy when it's running the on stop um, method. And again, requests won't be routed to 
the the role endpoints um, while this is actually happening. And then uh, so uh, the events that occur here, other than just a statics check, um, it's actually going to physically stop the machine, so it goes into a stopping event. So there's a little bit of a difference between roles and instances. Um, because you can define your application in kind of this uh, multi-tiered set of responsibilities, um, those are referred to as the roles, but um, because you know, maybe want some higher scalability, or you want to you, you want to actually uh, you know, have some availability or or uh, control over the size of your application, let's say um, you may want to increase the amount of roles or or uh, instances of that role that actually exist, and so that's where kind of the difference between roles and instances comes in. Um, it's pro it's definitely not. Uh, recommended to only run one run one instance of a role uh, when you are you know running your application because there's no guarantee um, that that application will be up 95 99.95% uh, 99 of the time um, because you know the actual app fabric doesn't have anything to work with if it needs to take down one of the instances um, so you had to have you know two plus um, roles or instances of a role uh, available for the app fabric to do that. So essentially, the roles are defined um, in the actual service definition or the package of your application, and they kind of define a, uh, a responsibility or one of the responsibilities of your application, be it the web endpoint or the backend processing um, uh, things. But then at runtime, um, when you actually deploy your service, you can specify how many instances you want of that role, and uh, they'll go behind uh, essentially a load balancer that will round robin load balance um, requests um, to the different roles. So this is just a little bit of an animation to kind of show how some of these things work. When you package up your cloud service, you may have uh, a web role and a worker role, um, but when you actually deploy it into production, um, you may know that uh, you know you're going to have a lot of background processing. This is a, a back, heavy background processing application, so you want three worker instances, and you also want that 99.95% um, availability. So you actually want two front end web instances. Um, so you actually deploy these role responsibilities to multiple machines. Now, when you actually are deploying um, two or more um, machines, then they get spread out into what are called fault domains. Um, so fault domains provide that that uh, uptime guarantee of 99.95%, um, but you actually have to have two instances of a role or more. Um, and uh, fault dom domains are isolated pieces um, that are on uh, uh, different you know, power grids, virtual networks, uh, physical networks, um, definitely machines, sometimes even different portions of the data center or uh, different data centers altogether. Um, and uh, it kind of depends on the level of the fault domain and, and uh, you know, the groups of the services and everything like that. But they're essentially um, fault tolerant um, kind of groups of services in a data center um, that you, know, you can be sure that your application doesn't have a single point of failure anywhere. So, all of this works because the fabric actually has a network load balancer that uh, is what's actually listening. That's the public IP for all of your instances. And uh, so behind the network load balancer, you could have any number of VMs. So in this case, we actually have nine VMs. This would be a fairly large you know, web service or something like that. So when you have nine VMs, you can see that one, two, three, uh, or one and two are on two different fault domains, three and four are on the same fault domains, and then they actually um, go into you know, fault domain three in some cases um, and things like that. So all these fault, dom fault domains are kind of in different portions of the data center. And so that uh, not, you know, you, if you only had VM one and VM two, you don't actually have a single point of failure um, in here too. So uh, if something were to happen to part of the data center, like, uh, you know, 
hard drives would crash or server racks uh, or server hosts would go down and different things like that. Um, it would take down one of the fault domains, but the other two are still there. And what the app fabric will actually do is it will stop routing information to that fault domain and it will spin up more VMs on the other subsequent fault domains um, if uh, something were to happen. Now, obviously this uh, is, um, or it, it kind of spins up the VMs in a different fault domain. So you you can imagine that there's not only three domains in uh, in a data center. So there's a, a, a variety of, of different fault domains to go to. So if you were only running two VMs, um, your second VM will actually um, get spun up in another fault domain. It won't actually go back to uh, fault domain one. So that's not really apparent in this um, particular um, diagram, but you can be sure that uh, if you have more than one instance, they'll always be on separate fault domains. And there's actually a portion in the UI that you can actually see um, the different fault domain numbers that your application um, instances are, are in. So that actually goes into uh, one of the other things, which is upgrade domains. So very much like fault domains, if you actually perform an upgrade to your service and you don't use some of the, the mechanisms for actually doing um, uh, you know, traffic redirection and different things like that, which I'll show you in a little bit, but if you actually just wanna straight upgrade your instances or the actual Windows Azure app fabric wants to upgrade your instances and install a new patch of the operating system on them and different things like that, um, because your applications are in different fault domains, they also provide the capability of doing upgrade domains as well. So it may take down one of your instances, but um, you know, all of the other instances in a different upgrade domain stay alive and they will actually go and upgrade in order based off of the upgrade domain. So um, the default is five. So if you actually have 10 services, you may actually get two machines that are taken down at once, um, but, uh, but you'll still have like a number of other machines that are, that are uh, you know, on, still online. Um, and there's a very, there's a large amount of control that you can uh, take in your applications to control your upgrade domains and, you know, what goes offline when there's an update. Um, if you have uh, some complexity in your application and require a certain number of PCs or a certain set of PCs stay online um, through upgrades. So I want to get into a demonstration of uh, how to actually develop and deploy to uh, Windows Azure. Um, so here, you, I hope you can see my Visual Studio screen, and uh, this is Visual Studio 2012 with the newest bits of uh, Windows Azure installed in there. So I'm actually just going to hit File, New Project. And in my new project window, I actually have a cloud um, uh, area for my cloud project template. Um, and uh, I can actually build a .NET Framework 4.5 Azure Cloud Service. And uh, so I'm just going to press OK on that. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually building up what um, is inside my Azure Cloud Service. So I can actually pick a number of different um, pre-canned roles and uh, pre-installed roles. Um, so here I have like base ASP.NET web roles for web form stuff, MVC4, MVC3, WCF service roles, and then a number of worker roles as, we're, as well here. So I have a regular worker role, which is kind of empty. I'll put one of those in there. And then I have a cache worker role, which is pre-configured to actually be uh, kind of a, a network level cache in front of my database, which can be very useful in some um, high load situations. And uh, worker role with uh, service that, that pulls from a service bus queue. A service bus queue is kind of another um, service that's provided in the Azure ecosystem that will allow um, people to um, process background messages. I'm also just going to put a web uh, MVC web role on here too. So that's not set in stone. You can add and remove roles all the time, um, but it allows you to just kind of start off. Um, nicely and and uh, create a new application. So I added an MVC4 project. So this is just a regular MVC4 um, project wizard. And I'll go through that. <clears throat> so what you can see on the side here is that I have uh, uh, a Windows Azure um, project, which is kind of the only unique project in here. Other than that, this is actually a very straightforward solution with a straightforward, um, you know, uh, assembly, uh, class library and uh, and web um, project. Um, but I have this extra, as soon as this gets out of the way, I'll show you this extra um, Windows Azure project, which contains a lot of the information that uh, will um, provision my application. 
So this is actually taking, here we go. Um, so here I have my Windows Azure project and my MB, MBC web role one and worker role one. And I can actually go to properties um, for these and change uh, some of the information. So here I can say that my base instance count when I want to do a deployment is going to be two. And the VM sizes actually are going to be extra small, not small, um, different things like that and uh, save it. And I can actually run this project locally with uh, Windows Azure emulators as well as do deployment. So I can actually right click on this Windows Azure project and say publish. And uh, once I choose my subscription, I can create a new cloud service. Um, and uh, I can choose, you know, East US. And that what that will actually do is uh, uh, creates a cloud service for me um, on Windows Azure because I actually have my Visual Studio and my Windows Azure connection um, kind of authenticated with each other. And uh, so I'm able to do this right from Visual Studio. I can actually go to the cloud uh, you know, portal and do this all, but uh, I'd rather just kind of see this done in Visual Studio. Um, so I'll just actually start this publish and we can see kind of what's happening later. But, you know, Everything is very, very simple here. It's um, just basically like this is all that a worker role is. It's, it starts you off with this one class and it has a public um, override void run. And then it says while true, it's sleeping and different things like that. So this in the worker role kind of uh, um, that I was talking about is, is how you actually manage your application lifecycle. Um, so here, the worker role will essentially uh, uh, you know, go through this while true loop and it's up to you to actually stop the service or, or start the service up right um, and, uh, and kind of keep the thread going. Um, whereas in a web role, you actually have a regular uh, web project that has all of the MVC components here. So I actually have different controllers and my home controller. Um, everything is set up for me, but I also have this capability of saying web role on start. So if I need to do any code that will actually run only once um, for the lifetime of my application here, uh, uh, as far as, uh, sorry, uh, per VM, um, then I can put it in the on start here. So that's just a quick uh, little demonstration about how easy it is to start and deploy um, you know, an application to Windows Azure. I already have one that I just deployed earlier today. And um, yeah, so it's actually fairly easy to do with the new tools in Visual Studio, or you can even go into uh, uh, you know, the portal and, and take a look at that. Um, speaking of which, I'll actually just open up this here um, and I'll show you my production. Oh. So this is actually my production URL um, uh, site that I deployed earlier, and it took me no time to actually create this uh, website. And then I have a public endpoint for this website as well. And it's just running uh, the MVC4 base project. So you see some um, base template for MVC as soon as it warms up here. There it is. So this is just the base MVC um, for project, and uh, it took me a, probably about less than 10 minutes to actually go from scratch to deployment, and I actually have a site URL and everything. Um, now, I'll kind of go back to a little bit of slides. So how does this actually help you, um, you know, develop and, and build your application? So Essentially, the, the process that you go through to build your application is you use Visual Studio to code and package your, your, your application in your roles and then upload those roles to Windows Azure, which will actually deploy them onto the fabric and onto the network load balancer and everything like that. And you kind of start from the beginning. Now, if you actually want to integrate this into uh, more of an agile practice, um, it's quite easy because the the main thing that you that helps you here is the actual shippable increment or or kind of the shippable application um, is very nice and packaged for you. Um, so you can actually do some sprint planning and go through an entire sprint, um, and at the end of it, you can just have a, a deployable package. Um, and uh, if you would like, you can throw that onto Windows Azure and start running load and, and unit tests against the application or push it into a production environment and then uh, uh, and 
and essentially you can uh, pass around this kind of shippable increment. It's not defined um, and there are some configuration files that you kind of get in there and, and change if you want to um, change the application on the fly if you're de deploying to different environments. Um, but the bulk of the code and everything for your application stays in this kind of little zip file. So to help out with your Agile practice um, is the Team Foundation service. So now the uh, Windows Azure actually integrates with the online version of Team Foundation Server, which is the Team Foundation service on visualstudio.com. Um, and what does this provide you with? It actually gives you governance um, over the complete software lifecycle from re requirements gathering all the way to testing and even um, you know DevOps and different things like that that they're moving into with the uh, Team Foundation uh, service and everything there. So um, it's highly, highly integrated with Visual Studio and Windows Azure um, and it supports a variety of different methodologies, everything from Agile to Waterfall and different stuff like that. And uh, so you can actually use the Team Foundation service. And um, right now, and I believe, uh, you know, for all time, I guess, um, if you want to start a small project with uh, only a few users and a single project, um, you can actually go to visualstudio.com and sign up for your free account um, right away. And you get a lot of really, really great features like hosted build um, and the portal functionalities and, and everything like that as well. So kind of everything comes in there. So what they provide you with now is uh, essentially TFS continuous integration. So I'll kind of show you how to set that up on the portal. So I actually have this uh, Dev Movement 2 um, instance that's going here. Um, so even now, like in the demo that I just finished, I'm already deploying to production. And right on the side here, I actually have set up TFS publishing. And so mine is tylerd.visualstudio.com. And I can authorize that connection with Visual Studio, allow Windows Azure to uh, manage or to you know, make requests and, and different things um, for me. And I have a list of the projects that I have in my Visual Studio environment and I'm just gonna pick test project. And it's what it's doing is actually linking um, my test project with this uh, deployment. Um, so I don't really actually have any deployments right now, but if I actually go over to my Visual Studio web, um, uh, service, I can go to test project and see in my build definitions, I have dev movement and dev movement to CD. So I actually have continuous deployment builds already set up for me. And even earlier today, I actually completed and deployed a, uh, uh, a build um, to Windows Azure very easily. It actually deployed automatically um, once I uh, checked in code. And that actually went right in here into the staging, um, staging area of the application. And so I can actually go to the staging area of the application and click on this site URL. Hopefully those goes a little bit faster than the previous one. It's just gonna take a second for uh, IAS and ASP.NET to warm up here. There it goes. So I actually, what I did change in my source control, as I said, you know, this message should say deployed from TFS and there it is. And I even have some information about that deployment um, and uh, uh, which should show up here in a second. And the same information that's actually in, uh, in TFS as well. Um, so just to kind of, that was just a quick demonstration of how easy it is to actually connect your uh, TFS environments um, to Windows Azure and you know, vice versa and, and uh, actually you know, sign up for a free, um, fully capable uh, application lifecycle management system that will even very, very easily deploy directly into the cloud and deploy to an endpoint that you have public access to if you want to do testing um, or uh, load testing or anything like that. Um, so I'm just going to switch back to some of the slides here. So what was actually happening in the background there? Um, you know, I was kind of going through things fairly quickly, and uh, you know that build was had been running in the past, um, and uh, I could probably run another build and and do more um, uh, deployments. 
So it was very, very easy to do with Visual Studio, but what was actually happening? So when you actually compile something for publish, um, you get two different artifacts. You get a service definition or a .cs def file, and then you get a service configuration or a .cs um, CFG file. Now, um, the code and the service definition file are actually encrypted and zipped together into a CS package file or, or a, a code package file. And then these final two pieces, the config and the package, are consumed by Windows Azure. So the service definition actually contains some of the provisioning information that you start off with with Windows Azure as like, you know, what the size of the virtual machines are and different things like that. Um, and uh, and then, but the CS config file actually provides the uh, capability to scale that up and down and do um, some other runtime configurations to the application. So what are the runtime settings um, or, or what kind of things actually affect the application at runtime, sorry. Um, so the CS config file, uh, or wait, sorry, the, the CS uh, definition file um, has a bunch of things like, uh, you know, startup tasks to install extra software. If you're doing PHP or Ruby or Python development, you kind of need to install a few packages onto your machine um, before your machine is uh, ready to actually receive uh, commands or or uh, or anything there. So essentially you have startup tasks that will set all those up for you. Um, also in this configuration file, you have the ability to set up the endpoints for remote desktop report, uh, support, um, and it also has to install some certificates to do remote desktop support, and all of that is in that, those configurations, um, as well as the endpoints that define your application. So if you actually have a couple of different virtual sites um, underneath the, the one IIS endpoint that's actually configured in there, or if you listen on multiple ports and multiple different uh, um, H or HTTP or TCP um, typed endpoints, that's also in this uh, these settings files. Um, so this is just a little bit on uh, how the packaging deployment works. So when you're in Microsoft Visual Studio, you actually create the roles and you saw in the demonstration that there's web roles and worker roles. And uh, those actually create these service artifacts and the model, which is essentially your compiled code and the CS config file. So the service artifacts and the model, which is essentially your code, will actually go into a CS package file and those will be uploaded to Windows Azure. So that is that actual deliverable piece that I was talking about earlier, which you can actually transfer around. And the CS config file is actually just XML, so you can change it kind of on the fly if you want to. Um, now the CS config file goes to the compute controller and the package actually gets deployed to the different machines. Um, so you can see there's a little load balancer there and the, the load balancer is actually um, controlled by the compute controller. So um, different configuration entries um, affect that as well as some of that uh, um, internal configuration that was packaged inside the CS package file. That highly affects the load balancer because those, um, those configurations define the, your endpoints, um, what size of the machine, how many machines you have and different things like that. And uh, like I was saying before, um, you can use TFS to actually automate this entire process, um, or you can um, actually build the CS package and CS config files yourself. Um, now, there's a couple of different application upgrade strategies, which I'll, I'll touch on right at the end here, um, or near the end here. So there's the staging versus production strategy, which is kind of like uh, your um, base, uh, let's see, traffic redirection strategy. So essentially traffic is going into production and production all the time. And then you actually deploy a sub environment in a little staging box off to the side. Um, and your load balancer is still sending all the information sent to the public IP address to production. Um, now you can actually swap it. So you can say, you know, n stop routing um, requests to production, start routing them to the staging environment. And uh, so essentially you've swapped the two um, and the production becomes the staging endpoint and the staging endpoint becomes the production endpoint. That's actually a really, really great way to uh, perform an upgrade because it allows you to actually switch it back very, very easily. So you can actually run it and start hitting the site and you have people starting to hit the site and your diagnostics are rolling in and everything like that. And if you actually see that the upgrade has caused a problem for a bunch of people or it's basically taking your site down, you can very easily say, oh, uh, swap them back. Right, and because your production, your previous production environment is still up and running, it's just kind of sitting off to the side in the staging environment. 
um, and uh, you can just say, okay, I want to stop routing information or, or requests to this new environment. Let's route it to the old environment again. And you, it's very, very easy for you to switch right back. Now, a little bit more difficult is the in-place upgrade. So the in-place upgrade essentially will um, upgrade the code and the model on the roles um, in a you know upgrade domain fashion. So it will only upgrade the you know upgrade domain number one first and then number two. So it tries as best as possible to keep everything online while it's upgrading. Um, but you may have some scenarios where you know people start getting you know, some people are getting the new stuff and some people are getting the old stuff and different things like that. Um, so it's it's faster. The in-place upgrade is a lot faster because you can get a lot of feedback from, uh, you know, just upgrading your code on the uh, uh, cloud service. Um, but it's a little bit more um, risky because, you know, you're, you're now upgrading that. And in order to roll back, you actually have to, you know, pull out a new package that has the old or the old package that has the old code on it and then uh, you know do an in-place upgrade of the old stuff again um, and whereas the staging production is kind of easy to kind of switch back and forth so I'm going to show off a little bit of that in the Windows Azure portal here um, so if you've noticed on my dashboard I've got these two main kind of top portions here so production and staging um, and I've already exercised my staging environment, which has this convoluted URL, which is basically just a GUID um, .cloudup.net. Um, but my production environment is devmovement.cloudup.net. Um, and uh, so um, what I can do is I can say swap. Are you sure you want to swap VIPs? Um, you know, there's, uh, it tells you kind of when each of them were created and different things like that. So yes, I want to swap the virtual IP to start redirecting to the different service, and hopefully this uh, doesn't take very long. So here, if I actually start refreshing this uh, Dev Movement Cloud App page, you can see that this now says deployed from TFS. You know, this if you remember from before, this is actually the the service that was in the staging environment previously. And if I actually go here, my staging environment is still up and running and, and perfectly fine. Um, it has my old code in it. So I can essentially go um, switch them back if I really want to. Um, but but I can kind of leave them up and running. And eventually I'll just kind of say, uh, you know, delete my staging um, deployment from the cloud service and uh, and then I'm saying, okay, I'm done. I'm everything is up and running just fine. I don't need my staging environment anymore. Um, now, let's see. If you want to talk about the uh, you know upgrade domains and different things like that, um, I only have one web role here. So actually, let's go to this one. Um, so if you actually look at the instances, you can actually see that you know my web roles are upgrade domain zero and one, but the worker role is actually upgrade domain zero again. So when you actually start doing an upgrade, it will know to keep one of these online because they're on different up update domains. Um, but this one, it's actually just going to update. Which in my case, you know, if I was creating a background process that was just, you know, listening on a queue and processing queue messages and uh, different things like that, um, then I don't, I think that's fine. I don't really need to, uh, uh, to do that. Um, I, I don't really need this to be online all the time. So this upgrade scenario is perfectly fine for me. Um, but the main thing is that I don't, have the ability to kind of switch back very, very easily. And I can actually go directly into here and I can say, oh, I want to create a new deployment. And you can browse through your package and configuration files from lo local or from a storage account that's actually in Windows Azure. Um, so you can actually store your um, previous packages and configurations from previous deployments into storage. Or um, if you actually do the deployments from TFS um, well, that this one has here, um, I can actually go to this, and uh, if I had more deployments, it would actually say redeploy. So I can actually do kind of a redeployment of a previous code base if I really wanted to. So there's lots and lots of ways for you to kind of keep everything online um, and keep everything going here in Windows Azure um, through your service management. So a lot of rich um, capabilities as far as service management goes. 
So what are the next steps um, for, you know, doing cloud service development on Windows Azure? Um, there's, uh, you know, a 90 day free trial that you can get to. You actually get a full account that just has a spending cap limit on it. So um, you won't be charged, but you do have to give your credit card um, in case you want to eventually make it a full account. Um, but there is a spending cap on the account. So that you don't have to worry about, you know, using uh, going over and being charged like hundreds of dollars and different things like that. And so um, one of the other things you, need, you can do is watch the Windows Azure virtual workshops. And uh, for a lot of the different, um, you know, the the uh, different situations for variations on cloud applications and, and connected and, and migrating applications to the cloud, there's a lot of really, really good talks on doing those. And one of the best resources that you can get to is the actual Windows Azure training kit, which includes a ton of demos um, and uh, different things um, from Windows Azure that, uh, that you can use and a variety of different applications and presentations from there. Um, don't forget to do your session evaluations and uh, uh, AKA MS uh, net to eval. And uh, yeah, I just, you know, overall, I thank you very much for uh, being here and, and listening to this. And if you have any questions, um, just post them, you know, either in the chat or, you know, send me an email. Um, my blog address is uh, Tyler, um, uh, tylerdirksen.com, T-U-I-L-E-R-D-O-E-R-K-S-E-N.com. And uh, then you can contact me there. But yeah, thanks very much um, for letting me do this presentation. And I hope you've learned something and, and that you're excited about doing you know, cloud development.